everybody. Welcome back to another video on the F30 series. Uh, we did release a video of the N20 in this engine having uh, died because of a cylinder three uh, rod bearing failure. Yep. Uh, and we've had this engine laying in the shop for like the last five months. And today is the day, November 1st, I think it's been about six months since this thing blew up at Coda, uh, that we are finally getting around to getting this car up and running again. So we have this used long block that's in great shape. But before this goes in and we're doing a couple of refreshes on it, uh, we're gonna be doing King engine bearings for the rod bearings because Upgrades, people. Upgrades. Upgrades. Uh, brand new oil pump, and really just refresh this and get it back to as good as it can be for a used engine. And then this is going to go back in that. And then hopefully in a couple weeks, we can do some skids around Lime Rock. Hopefully. And uh, with that, usually we're pretty DIY friendly, but today we're just trying to get these swapped out. So you do your thing on the engine, I'll do my thing to get everything out of the way. Let's do it. Let's do the thing. Let's look at the oil filter here, real quick. Uh, your used engine should have an oil filter in it. If it doesn't, I would think that's a red flag. Uh, the red flag for me on this one is uh, we've got a really nice aftermarket oil filter on this, hence the red O-ring. And uh, yeah, this is like a quick lube oil filter. So I don't know. I don't like to see that, but that just is what it is. There is no debris in the pleats. Nothing shiny, so that's a good sign. I mean, even though this is a crappy aftermarket filter, uh, it's 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 fine. A lot of fuel in that. Move some stuff off the top of the engine. I'm gonna roll it over to get the oil pan off, balance shaft assembly, oil pump, all that good stuff, and then I will have access to the bottom end of the engine. Normally, I would not suggest holding the engine, but this thing is so light. It's actually okay. It's the only positive about these things. They're pretty small and they don't weigh much. Sure is. So this is the oil pan baffle that uh, Alex designed because we knew that uh, the rear wheel drive variant of these cars has an issue with oil starvation. But it also fits the plastic pan. Huh? It also fits the plastic pan. Well, no, 100%, but the, ironically enough, X-Drive cars don't have that because the axle shaft would come through here and that actually prevents oil from sloshing forward. Uh, so Alex designed this one piece bolt-on baffle that goes to the balance shaft assembly and this prevents oil from just sloshing all over the pan. Um, so pretty simple design. And uh, we do have a video showing this thing working and working very well. Where can people get this awesome baffle? FCP Euro. But yeah, it just sits on the balance shaft assembly like that. And it just kind of takes up this additional space where the oil would normally slosh forward. And also it blocks off these like additional oil reservoirs where oil would normally pull into on uh, severe right-hand turns. So it works. All right, so I suspect uh, we're gonna see the same kind of upper rod bearing wear on all four cylinders, which is why we're putting new ones in today to give this engine an opportunity to live a slightly longer life, you know? Even though it's still probably gonna blow up, but. That's the spirit. Seven, eight rod bolts, gotta have those. So King has a couple different engine bearings. These are more their OEM style, but you can see they do have like a little bit of a coating on it. It's like a break-in coating, but these are, unlike your standard uh, engine bearings from BMW where you have to buy them individually, um, particularly on rod bearings, they would have a different color code, uh, upper and lower, because uh, they're ground differently, whereas a lot of your aftermarket bearings are pretty much a one size fits all, so there's no upper, there is no lower. In this case, the tang is in a specific position, which puts it upper or lower, but uh, a lot of your aftermarket bearings don't have some of the ordering complexities that your original bearings might have. 
which kind of makes it easier to live with when, especially when you're building an engine. Now, of course, it's always a good idea to check your clearances and stuff like that, which we're gonna do um, with plastic gauge. That's the BMW method. But um, I'm pretty much just gonna check one, and as long as it's within the spec, I'm gonna call it good on the rest of them. It's kind of wild how the cooling system is like self-suspending. Like there isn't, there aren't really many brackets that hold the cooling lines and fittings and pumps and and connections to the car. It's just the sheer amount of hoses holds the hoses to the car. So I think we have everything basically disconnected. Um, I'm leaving most of the coolant lines in the car. Um, and I'm leaving like the trans lines on the transmission and connect the subframe. So I'm just disconnecting things to the front end and the body, like the wiring. And then I'm just gonna drop everything all down at once. The only thing I don't know about is if these heater core lines are gonna get tangled up in the mess. We're also trying to leave the AC compressor uh, plumbed and attached to the body. And I'm gonna try to just kind of move it around the alternator. Uh, we might have to pull the intake manifold off, but we'll see, I don't think so. Uh, so. Yeah, she's pretty much ready to come out. There's always one one item left, that last like tendon that gets broken as you drop the heart away from the car, but I think that's everything. By the way, this is kind of interesting. The wear, on the loaded side, you flip it over. Whoa. Whoa. I've never seen that before. That may have been moving around. No, I don't think so. Uh, I think so. Or is this like basically oval or something? That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm saying. I think it was moving around in the in the block or in the lower uh, carrier. It matches up with where the wear is. So the back side versus the fairing side. So now is the part where the AC pump is going to hate us a lot. And if we do somehow break one of the AC lines while we're doing this, everyone in this room will all know at the exact same time. have determined that even with the situation of not having the engine properly bolted to the subframe, this is still 100% less sketchy than it would be. Yeah. I mean, that really wasn't that bad. It just seemed sketchy because we were uh, floating the subframe. Yeah. All right, uh, quick update. Uh, we didn't die. Um, we had a good moment with the jack on the lift table with no front left motor mount because we didn't think we were going to have a lift table to do this. So got a little bit dicey, but as it always does with the first time you do this. I've never worked on an F30 before, so this is the first time. Um, but she's out. We left the AC compressor in as well. Uh, didn't discharge it. Did also didn't discharge it into my face, which was nice. Um, Garrett's almost done putting the bearing, King bearings in, and then we're, we'll be good to put this all back together and in the car. This is some automotive design engineer going too far. Science has gone too far. Incorporating sheet metal design into plumbing is when you've gone too far. Just the fact that the fuel evap line goes, this is, this is actually crazy. Gareth, this is a fuel evap, part of the fuel PCV system, right? This line here? Yeah. So this goes from the upper left corner of the engine in the back where you can barely fit your hand all the way forward, all the way through here, up, pressure sensor, through the front, clips onto the front of the block, goes to here, which whatever that is broke off of here. Then it goes down, then it connects to this 
port on the bottom of the block next to the turbo fitting obscured by the turbocharger. So on the end of the crankshaft here, uh, all the N series engines, so N52, N54, N55, uh, N20, N26, S55, the crankshaft is not keyed to any of the timing components. It's all a, it's all a friction fit, right? So uh, BMW did updates on the N20 timing set where the new ones have a, a laser engraved diamond cut like friction surface. Originally they were using these sort of like friction rings to kind of hold it all together, which kind of sucks. Um, so that tells me these are all original timing components in this engine. Um, we'll show you what the new ones look like, but these are definitely the original timing components. So I actually be interested to see how long this chain is. Usually, if you see an N20, it's probably had at least one timing service, but this one is still original. So that means this car was either never driven, and I was just driving down the road one day and met its demise. Or the earphone found it. I mean, that happens too. We know this. I know this. Rip. They're getting to the, they're gonna, there's an apex in between the two graphs of complete engine-ness. This is what turns Vanos on and off. And then it allows oil flow into the into the sprocket. You can see it actually moving. You can see light moving around in there. See that? Mm -hmm. That's the, how the Vanos works. It allows oil into this and then this advances or retards the cam timing. You can see the spring on the backside that puts it into its normal position. You can see it through the here. And that's how it works. That's modern day, super compressed Vanos unit, which is honestly really cool. For the viewers, this green thing we installed is really trick because, so on N20s, these cam sprockets don't actually have to be aligned to anything. They can just be whatever. But the reluctor wheels in the front, the stamped pieces do have to be aligned uh, along with, of course, the cam. So we have a cam lock in and then separately we have this green thing which pins the reluctor wheels and then you sandwich it all together when you torque the bolt. And then it's timed. Well, you have to be at TDC or whatever position as well. So we got that. We put that with the timing tool set. Um, I'd like to torque this and torque those two and then that'll be that. Yep. <sighs> Welcome back. It's been a week and uh, plugged away over the last week or so assembling the new engine that's going in. Um, it's kind of interesting because every time you do an engine swap, I mean, realistically, you're not going to be using new everything. So basically, I feel like I was removing parts from a corpse, which is that engine right there, and putting on the new donor. And uh, we now have pretty much fully assembled engine going back in. Also, the AGA tools lift table. Um, did not have video of the engine coming off, but look, the transmission stayed in place. We have it nicely supported. Subframe stays in place. Everything is still square. So all I'm gonna do is basically just drop this engine onto the subframe, line the engine mount holes up, torque the uh, torque converter to the flex plate, and we have a full assembly ready to go back in the car. Easy peasy. Only thing we're doing differently putting it back in is I'm leaving the alternator out and uh, intake manifold off so that AC compressor is not terribly in the way when it's going back in. But other than that, uh, pretty much going back in the way that it came out. Uh, 
uh, and any automatic transmission car, with, it, with the exception of some of the new hybrid automatics, which use a dual mass flywheel, you need to line up the torque converter and the flex plate. Uh, these will actually spin independently of each other, so I'm spinning the torque converter. Uh, but you just have to get it so that the hole on the flex plate lines up, and then you'll usually have an access hole somewhere on the transmission uh, to bolt these together. There's one on the bottom, there's one on the side, obviously sitting on this engine table. I'm gonna do it from the side because that's the easiest spot to do it. I just need to grab a screwdriver just to move it up a little bit, and then I'll be able to get one screw in, and then once I have one screw in, I can put all of them in, and then I'll torque them to spec, and then these two units will be mated together. Well, here goes nothing. Um, put about as much as, on this engine as I really want to at this point. Um, right now, the, the challenge is gonna be to line everything back up, uh, but we do have enough movement with the lift table that we should be able to get the subframe holes lined up. Uh, our challenge with going back in is kind of the same as when it came out. We just need to make sure that the uh, AC compressor lines, nothing gets stuck on that. Uh, but with the intake manifold off the engine, easy enough to put that back on with it in the engine bay. Um, that should minimize some of that hassle. I uh, also need to make sure the electric connections for the uh, power steering rack are good to go. Let me line the steering rack up, speaking of which. I like to make sure the steering rack is back to its neutral setting before putting an engine back in. Um, also gonna make sure that our ratchet strap is out of the way, which it is. Let's do it. On the F30 sedan, unfortunately, every variant came with this plastic 8 HP transmission pan. Uh, not only is this something that could explode if you find a curb at the wrong time, but it also uh, has pretty limited capacity. So we're gonna upgrade it with our X5M aluminum pan upgrade. Uh, this is a ZF OE part, which is super cool. Um, it also adds quite a bit of capacity. And if you're thinking, holy crap, that is really deep, you don't have to worry too much because the pan is actually quite a bit higher than the skid plate uh, on the stock car. So this should bring the pan height down to right around where the skid plate is. Uh, it's aluminum, it's got these sweet cooling fins, looks awesome and should bolt right up. While I've been away at SEMA Apex, Gareth has graciously finished putting the F30 back together and last night we got it primed and started for the first time. It's important to remember to prime your turbo as well as prime the engine oil after a fresh build. So the king bearing should help us have some fun on the skid pad tomorrow at the FCP Euro Proving Grounds. After all the trials and tribulations of learning the N20, we still believe in this platform. Maybe we got to know it a bit more than we had expected, but the deeper we dive, the more we understand and appreciate what BMW was trying to achieve here. As a true homage to the 320SI E90, we still love our 328SI project car, no matter how many engines it may or may not go through. Thank <laughs> you.